Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here at the Royal Institution to give this set of Christmas lectures on the planets. This is uh, 150 years after Michael Faraday gave his first Christmas lecture, and there's a distinguished scientific tradition at uh, the Royal Institution, which I'm very pleased to play a small part of. My topic is the planets. We, of course, live on one. It's called the Earth. And it is a tiny little planet made of rock and metal with a tiny, thin atmosphere around it, clouds, water, rocks, mountains, and uh, life. And one point of interest is to what extent is this the case on other planets? To what extent are things there different from here? This machine is called an orrery, and uh, it is a kind of mechanical device to show how the planets move. Uh, there were lots of them made a few centuries ago, not so many these days. The brass sphere in the middle is supposed to represent the sun. And if I turn this crank, you can see the planets moving. The innermost planets moving very fast, the outermost planets moving extremely slowly. The fastest moving one here is Mercury. The next one is Venus. This one here is the Earth with the moon next to it. And then Mars, Jupiter with four of its 12 or so moons shown. And then over here, Saturn with its rings and five of its 10 or so moons shown. Beyond Saturn, except it would be too big to fit on this orrery, are the planets Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, and uh, perhaps even some others. There's been a recent discovery of a tiny little planet out here uh, between Saturn and Uranus. Perhaps it is a single small planet, or perhaps it is one of a great horde of little planets which might circle the sun out here. There is a horde of uh, small objects which circles the sun between uh, Mars and Jupiter called the asteroids. We are just beginning to explore the planets. We are only in the earliest stages of understanding them. And I would like to begin by giving you a sort of uh, bird's eye view of some of them. <coughs> The first picture here is uh, intended for orientation. Uh, we're on this third one, and you can see what a tiny and insignificant planet it is. And uh, <clears throat> the solar system is mainly these large planets in the outer solar system. We are on the debris, the little tiny chunks of incidental matter in the inside of the solar system. Now, people have long dreamt of traveling from one world to another. There are various methods of doing it. Uh, this is one uh, suggested by a French artist named Grandvie in the last century. Uh, it's a lovely way to do it, if only we could figure out how to build the bridge. But uh, we haven't figured that out, and our method is quite different. It's to send a spacecraft from the Earth to the other planets. And the other objects in the solar system are really quite nice. This is a photograph of the moon. You can see the dark, smooth, lowland regions. The bright. This is, uh, this is music for this occasion. Uh, it is Japanese shakuhachi music. And uh, why we're using this music, I will say in just a moment. The bright, rough areas of the moon are highlands. And you can see that there are holes or craters which pit the moon, and they are produced by the impacts of large objects falling from space throughout geological time. The solar system is very old, four and a half billion years old, and the scars of early catastrophes still exist on the lunar surface. A close-up view of the lunar surface shows not just craters, but also this remarkable, wiggly, sinuous rill whose origin is still being debated. There are many craters. Here is a close-up of one. And we will, in a later lecture, 
not only talk about craters, we will make some in a generally non-destructive way, and we will not, not harm too many people as we make a crater. This is a very large crater, the one you just saw. We will make small ones later. There are craters not just on the moon. Here is a mosaic of photographs of Mercury, and uh, this, this detail was not known until very recently. This is a result of the Mariner 10 spacecraft to Mercury, and you can see a great deal of detail, but again, including craters. If we move outward from the Earth, we come to the planet Mars, which we see here in a lovely Viking photograph. And here, the big craters that you see are not made by impact, by collision. These are volcanic craters. Mars has, among many most interesting features, extraordinarily large volcanoes, the largest of which is almost 30 kilometers high, 80,000 feet high. That is a very large volcano. Mars is a lovely, beautiful, interesting world, in some ways very much like the Earth, in some ways extraordinarily different, and we will devote a few lectures later on to studying Mars. Beyond Mars, we leave the terrestrial or Earth-like planets and come to the first of the great gas giants, Jupiter. Everything we're looking at here is clouds and atmosphere. If there is a surface to Jupiter, it is far below the region we can see. The weather or meteorology on Jupiter is very different from the Earth, very interesting, will teach us much as the studying of all the planets will do about our own planet. Jupiter has a number of moons. What you are seeing now are the very best Pioneer 11 photographs of one of the moons of Jupiter. We can see almost nothing at all. And this is the best picture we have at the present time. In 1979, two spacecraft called Voyager will pass very close to the moons of Jupiter, and we will obtain 50,000 photographs of Jupiter, Saturn, and their 20-some-odd moons. And we will have turned our almost complete ignorance about these moons into great knowledge. These moons, by the way, are not like our own. Some of them are icy. Some of them are covered with uh, sodium and other salts, uh, as if there was a great ocean which lost was lost into space. These are very strange places, and they will be very interesting to explore. Beyond Jupiter and its moons is Saturn, the great ringed planet. The nature of the rings is something we'll say a word about later. The Voyager spacecraft will also pass by Saturn and its rings. It will, in fact, then pass perhaps by Uranus, if it is still working and will inexorably leave the solar system. It will. It is condemned to wander forever in the dark between the stars. Its transmitters will eventually die, and it will be silent, but still the most distant emissary of mankind. We thought that in the remote chance that there are other beings on planets of other stars who wander between the stars and capture derelict spacecraft from backward civilizations like ours, that it might be nice to send a message. And so there are phonograph records on each of the two Voyager spacecraft with instructions 